I want to introduce you to uh, Robinson's Arch in Jerusalem. This is a picture I took uh, on one of my tours to Israel. Uh, this is uh, what you would know. Uh, uh, this is a... Uh, this is looking from uh, uh, looking north. Is what this is uh, uh, from the west. This is what would be currently the Western Wall, uh, and that particular arch, uh, uh, which was discovered by Robinson, uh, and this is the construction they theorize of what it was, uh, led into the Temple Mount. Today, there's a wooden structure there that you go up uh, into the uh, Temple Mount area through Israeli security, uh, and it dumps you out on the on the southern wall is the Al Aqsa Mosque, and then to your left is the Dome of the Rock. But I, I swing around through there and go north of the, uh, the Dome of the Rock to teach about the archaeological evidence for the temple being on the north side of the Dome of the Rock um, and uh, the, the messianic implications of that for when the Christ returns. But that's a whole other thing. Robinson's Arch. Uh, when, uh, when Rome attacked Israel and, and attacked Jerusalem, uh, they leveled the Temple Mount. Uh, they took this arch and they destroyed it. Uh, and Rome was uh, very skilled uh, at, arch at uh, uh, architecture uh, with all the aqueducts and things that they built. So they knew exactly how to knock this down. Um, and what they did is they uh, sent troops uh, to attack these stones right up here in the middle. Uh, those, uh, those were the keystones that held everything together. All the pressure of the walls was on those stones. So all they had to do was remove a few of those and the whole thing fell to the ground. Uh, here's another picture I took. Uh, looking north again. Uh, this is uh, the southern wall of the Temple Mount. Looking down that western wall, um, up on that wall would have, would have been where the Robinson's Arch would have been. Uh, it is uh, not there any longer. That particular uh, point of the, of the right up here, that area up there is where the trumpeter used to stand and, and, and play his trumpet to call Israel to worship. You imagine how much that would have sounded in the morning when you came on Shabbat and could hear the trumpeter. Um, that was also the pinnacle of the temple where the devil took Je Jesus to tempt him. Cast yourself down from here. This is that location. It's very high and lofty. Uh, now if you look down at the bottom of the street, the third slide will show you what it looks like now. At the bottom of that wall, uh, what you have is rubble. That's what you have. You have the original stones from the time of Christ and rubble everywhere. Now those stones may not look that big, the ones that are uh, still stacked on top of each other. Uh, they estimate that they weigh 40 to 60 tons apiece. They're massive, massive. Uh, and it's just amazing what they were able to do. Uh, and the Solomonic stones are down underneath with Herodian stones uh, built up on top of that. Um, and it's just an architectural novel. But what I want to focus on is, is how that wall fell, how simple it was to knock that wall down. Or not the wall, the, uh, the arch. Uh, just remove a few stones in the middle, and the whole thing came crashing down. To me, that is a, a spiritual metaphor, is it not? <laughs> Because, uh, and, and I've used the uh, wrestling analogies because I wrestled some in high school, and I, use, and I understand wrestling technique, but sometimes in wrestling I've told you, you, use, you go after your, your uh, opponent's weak points, and you exploit them. Uh, but sometimes you go after the, the strong points. That's what the devil does. He's very crafty, is he not? His bag of tricks to get you to live a carnal life is full of tricks. Uh, and if he's not going after weak points, he's going to go after the strong points. And so if you think about Robinson's arch as like your life, those keystones are like the key things in your life that those key things that that really hold you together, uh, those are things he can go after, like your integrity, your honesty, uh, your work ethic, your purity, your sexual purity. Uh, go figure. I mean, so can you list a whole long line of things there. These are the things that the old devil incrementally will begin to attack to shimmy those stones out, to get them to fall to the ground, to get you to compromise yourself, to knock your, your bridge down to, to greater living. And maybe you're sitting here today going, that is exactly what has happened to me. And you can, you can tell me which stones the, the devil uh, nailed you with. Uh, and you're looking at your life as a Christian going, it's a shambles. My, my life looks like that street. It's, just a, it's, it's messed up because of what I did. Um, how do I get back from whence I came as a Christian? I mean, how do you live in victory? Is it possible to live in victory? Paul understood what it was like to deal with the devil cause he, and deal with sin because he talked about it in chapter 7, did he not? A way of review, go back to chapter 7. He talks about how the things I would love to do, I do not. But, you know, sin, I battle with sin. And he, and he talks about his battle with sin as a Christian man. But in ends chapter 7 by extolling the name of Christ. He says, Christ is the one who helps me as a man who deals with sin to gain victory. Uh, so if you're here today, I'm here to encourage you, uh, challenge you, to motivate you to better living. Uh, and that's what chapter 8 is about. 8 is about how to gain victory in your walk with Christ. Because you're going to struggle with your old man, the old sinful nature. So we want to review, because I've said before, and I'll say again, because uh, it's good to repeat things. Uh, repetition is wonderful, because uh, there's much we forget from week to week, day to day, 
moment to moment. So let's review. What did Paul say here in this chapter, verses 1 through 11, about victorious living? Uh, just to review, he said, if you want to live a victorious life, verse 1, realize what he calls the principle of victorious living, which is there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Once you're justified by faith in God's court of law, the gavel came down, you have the righteousness of Christ, you are not guilty anymore of God's court of law. You are forgiven based on your faith in Jesus. Uh, once you realize that lofty theological position, that leads to new living. Point two, uh, verses two to four, he says, I realize the power of victorious living, that you are freed from the shackles of who you used to be, and now you are a free person to follow your new master, Christ. Uh, verses 5 through 11, he uh, talked about uh, realize the presence of the power in your life. The power is the Spirit of God. That you can tap into that power. Um, think of like a switch analogies to like a drag car racer. or He's got his car souped up and he's got a, a nitro uh, insert into his engine. When he throws that switch, what happens to his vehicle? Or do you know? Do you have this kind of car? Yeah, I wish I had this kind of car. Especially in the traffic around here. You just throw that little switch and boom, you're gone. See, that's like the Spirit of God. He's like your nitro uh, tank in the car waiting to take off. Obviously, you're not into race, racing, but it's okay. Neither am I. It leads to tickets. But anyway, moving on. You try doing this. <laughs> uh, but that's the power of the Spirit. Do I unleash His power in my life for victorious living, or do I hold the Spirit at bay? Uh, great question. We already talked about that. Point four. How do you go to, into victorious living? Uh, realize what he's going to tell you in verses 12 to 13 is what I would call the path of victorious living. The path. Well, he's going to give you some counsel here. I call it helpful counsel. He says, So then, brethren, um, we, are, we are as Christians under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. That's the negative thing. What's the positive implication? Well, if I'm not under obligation to live according to my old sinful self anymore because I'm saved, the positive implication is I am under obligation to live holy in light of my new master, Christ. That's the implication. But he uses that little combination, so then. This is a uh, rhetorical device that he uses quite often in his books. Uh, Araun is what it's called in Greek. He, he uses this to summarize his argument. So he's laid down the groundwork for great Christian living, verses 1 through 11. He's told you, I struggle with sin in chapter 7. And now he's going to tell you, based upon all the things I've just ta talked to you about, let's summarize my argument. So then, brethren, we're not under obligation to the flesh anymore. I don't have to live the old way that I used to live anymore. I'm free. I'm free you realize that you're free. Now, uh, who is he speaking to here? What, is it, what does he say? So then who? Brethren. 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 Who are the brethren? The, well, the believers in Christ in Rome. It's not, it's not a trick question. Imagine taking tests from Paul. They'd be easy. Who are you writing to? The brethren. Who's that? Those are Christians, Jews and Gentiles. He says, I'm um, speaking to Christians, and remember who you are. You are believers that don't have to feel obliged to fulfill the deeds of the flesh anymore. Leads to a natural question. Is it possible for a Christian to live according to the flesh? Is it Absolutely it is. Not unless we're a sinless church and I just lost my job. Because we sin, do we not? Yeah, we sin. And so Paul, Paul says, uh, you're not obligated to the flesh, but the implication is you can live as if you're obligated to the flesh if you're not careful. So don't do that. Uh, is it possible to live carnal according to uh, you know, your Christian walk. Yeah, because you have a free will. And how do I know that? Well, I've lived, I've walked with Christ since 1967. I've watched my life. It goes up and down. Obedience, disobedience, obedience, disobedience. Um, and I've read the Bible, like 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. Paul writing to the Corinthian church, the believers there, he founded this church. This church was how not to do church. You name it, they did it there. They they took each other to court. They had sexual sin of all kinds running rampant in the church. You, it was the most messed up church. They constantly attacked Paul as the, as the pastor, constantly calling his character into question. He's constantly defending himself. What does he tell them in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20? He says, do you Corinthians not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you? Have you forgot about that? He says, whom you have from God and that you're not your own, for you have been bought with a price Therefore, let me conclude this for you. If Christ's blood bought you and redeemed you, therefore what should you do? Well, glorify God in your body. What's he telling them? You're not glorifying God in your body. Is it possible for a Christian to get into carnal living? Yeah, they did. They did. And Paul gives them some counsel here. Uh, you're not obligated anymore to live according to the flesh. You don't have to live a carnal life. Choose a godly life. What's the devil do? He looks at key things in your life sometimes, the positive things and begins to shimmy them out of your life a little bit. Never happens in a big manner because you'd see him doing it, right? 
just small little things. Little lie here, little deception here, didn't tell all the truth here, etc. And all those things eventually lead to things. He says, realize what's happening. It's counsel. And then from the counsel that he gives us, he moves from counsel to caution. Because he's a pastor. He's going to caution. And he says, uh, and it's a conditional. He says, for if you are, speaking to Christians, for if you are living according to the flesh, which is totally possible because Christians can live carnally, you must die. But if by the Spirit, second conditional clause, if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What is he talking about? He's given Christians whom he's speaking to a warning here. There's two main viewpoints of what he's speaking about here. And to get into this, we have to kind of go into the deep end of the swimming pool for a minute, okay? I know you're, I know you're excited. I am. But we're going to go from the shallow end to the deep end just for a moment, all right? You can't stop me, so I you know, make no apologies. But... Because I'm just following Paul, what Paul's talking about. So there's two main views of how to see what Paul is speaking to here. And it all depends on who is he speaking about. So uh, view number one sees these two conditional clauses to refer to the, the non-Christian first and the Christian second. So that view, which used to be my view for many, many years, but I, had, I saw there was a tenuous nature to it, but I could never figure out how to get out of it, what it was. So the first part of the view says, if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. Ah, that's hellfire, that's death, you've separated from God, that's the non-Christian. What's the other side? But, second conditional clause, if you by the Spirit are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Ah, that's heaven. There's a major theological problem with that. Do you see the theological problem with that? He's talking to the brethren. He's talking to the brethren. He's telling them, oh, you want to get into heaven and live? Well, you've got to deal with sin. And if you don't deal with sin enough, then the implication would be you won't go to heaven. So anyway, I'll tell you why I abandoned that view in just a minute. But that's, that's the one view, non-Christians and Christians. View number two is the, the Arminian viewpoint. Oh, he's talking about uh, Christians here on both sides of the, of the equation. And he's telling them if you don't follow hard after God, you will lose your salvation. Well, we've already spent, uh, how long have we been in Romans? Forever. Forever. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask me like what book am I going to do next before I retire I'm just staying here I mean next eight or nine years uh, we've, been in, we've been in I've already done Acts uh, spent three years in, in Matthew by the way but, um, but when you think, think about this uh, Paul is telling you uh, all throughout Romans you're justified by faith and that it is a sealed deal nothing unjustifies you how many sins would it take to unjustify you before God Uno, one, right? Eins, whatever your language is. Echad, if you're Hebrew, one, one sin. But when you're justified by faith, it's forever. And so, you know, the Armenian viewpoint, uh, you know, it looks like it's plausible in a couple, couple of places, but it's completely tenuous because it doesn't theologically hold together consistently. So I, I reject that one outright. But what about the other viewpoint? Well, he's talking about Christian, non-Christians and Christians. Well, I don't hold that viewpoint anymore. I think he's thinking about view three. I think he's addressing Christians on both sides of the equation. Why? Because he's given us a warning. What's the warning? If you're justified by faith, do not presume upon the justification by faith and use that as a pretense for sin. He's already talked about that in chapter six. Now follow me on this. Oh, so I'm eternally secure. If I'm eternally secure, then wow, I can just kind of do whatever and it's okay. No, it's not okay. Why is it not okay? Because God's holy, and you're his child. Let's get into that. He's a warning to Christians. And let's, I'll move you through my, my, my point. I have 67 concepts I'm going to share with you. <laughs> That's, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I really, I, I have six things I want to share with you. You're thinking, thank, thank you, Lord, thank you. Uh, number one, uh, the reason why I, I, I left the second viewpoint, or, the, or the, that first viewpoint, is because the entire context, he's speaking to believers. Chapter 7 and 8, he's speaking to believers. And we know their justification by faith saves them, not their works. Number two, if Paul is talking about unbelievers, then it's, this is not really a potent warning to Christians at all. It's a warning to Christians, if you live according to the flesh, you die. There's, there's, hell is basically what he's saying for you. But if you live according to the Spirit, you're going you're gonna to live. Well, yeah, that's a done deal if I'm justified by faith. Uh, but it kind of dilutes the warning. Number three, uh, the Corinthians, as I already noted, were extolled for their high position in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In fact, his argument on their great position in Christ culminates in 1 Corinthians 1.30, if you want to read it. 
But why is it so important to note, note their, their position in Christ? Because when he gets to chapter 3, he tells them, well, I, I'll just read it to you. 1 Corinthians 3. I wasn't going to do this, but I'll just read it to you. What, what does he say to the Corinthians that he just extolled their high position in Christ? Verse 1 of chapter 3. Brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not milk as the inner, uh, simple elementary biblical teaching. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, the harder theological treating, teaching. For you, until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able to receive it. Why? For you're still carnal. For where there are envy, which I see in your church, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Is it possible for the believers to choose carnality? Absolutely. They did in Corinth. Did they lose their salvation? No. No. He calls them carnal Christians, not Christians who lost their salvation, not Christians who professed but didn't look like Christians. They're Christians. And if you study the chronology of the book, it's been five years since he founded this church. They had five years to grow up in Christ, and they had not. They were carnal. So Paul castigates them. And what is he telling them here, here, in, here in, a, in Romans chapter 8, verse 13? And from my viewpoint is, if you are a Christian and you claim the name of Christ and you're justified by faith and you choose to live a sinful life, a carnal life, you arouse the holiness of God, the jealousy of God Almighty. Do you think he's static? No. Paul says he's your heavenly father. He will move to deal with you. This is exactly what he's saying here. You must put to death the deeds of the body. Uh, that is, a, is, a, is my fourth point. Uh, putting to death the deeds of the body... Uh, uh, Thanatute is what it is in, in Greek. It means to uh, perpetually put to death the deeds of the body. Like what? Well, I have an anger, anger issue. I have a lust issue. I have a, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a critical person. I mean, whatever it is that is your problem, you constantly have to look at your life, say, God, show me my sin, and then mortify that. Put it to death. Not, don't allow a little bit of it. Get rid of that by God's power. Confess it first. But you must constantly do that. If you constantly must do that, that could not be the foundation of salvation because that's a work to secure salvation. You follow? Don't lie. You follow? <laughs> I left you on point one. I mean, think about this. Mortification. If I must mortify sin constantly, would I ever know my, my salvation secure? No. no. Why? Because I would never know if I mortified enough sin to be secure in my salvation. This is why it's not about salvation. When I was of that viewpoint, I was depressed all the time as a young man. Because I thought, what about John 10.10? 10? Christ came to give me life and give it abundantly. How come I don't have abundant life and I'm joyous all the time? I'm always worried about, have I done enough? Because I had the wrong viewpoint of what Paul was talking about here. See, Paul's not talking about salvation here. He's talking about obedience as a saved person. Point number five. Just because Paul talks about uh, living and dying here doesn't mean that he's talking about heaven and hell. Because uh, the word for life here and, and death can also denote physical death, not just spiritual death. Well, what's that mean? Well, what it means is, in Paul's warning, if you choose to drag the name of Christ through the mud as a, as a saint of Christ, you're his child, and you choose to carnally do that, he's not static. He's holy. And you challenge his holiness, he moves to get your attention. What can he do? He has a whole lot of things in his repertoire he can use, from getting your attention through conviction down to removing you from the planet. And I'll be clear on this. I had a guy come into me after the last service to say, do you mean you believe God took out your best friend? Absolutely I do. And my best friend thought the same thing. Uh, Liz knew my best friend, Alan Reasoner. He spent half his life in San Quentin. I met him when we first got married, when he just got out of San Quentin. I offered him a job on our landscape company. Uh, he worked with me. I uh, hung with him. I have his Bible on my desk from San Quentin. I have his last letter in my office drawer to remember Alan's walk with God. But, but Alan, I mean, I, would, I trusted Liz with him many times because I knew he would defend my wife to the core. Great guy. But you had to see him. Tattoos all over his body, weightlifter kind of guy, long goatee, long blonde hair. I actually had long blonde hair back then too. I had hair. Um, <laughs> you know, we went one day to go see his parole officer and I was walking in like I was one of the boys, you know, the gangsters walking in. And, he, and I'm like, I kind of feel like you, man. And he's like, <laughs> you stick out. You know, <laughs> Yeah, but, but Alan, uh, when I left uh, to go to Dallas Seminary, and I'd spent a year discipling him. We were listening to tapes in the truck and talking about theological stuff in the truck. And when I we left to go to Dallas Seminary, and I've told this story years ago, so I'm repeating myself, and I actually know I'm repeating myself, which is a good sign. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Uh, Alan, uh, uh, Alan, you don't remember back before phones and you had to write, actually write a letter? Uh, so he used to send me letters in Dallas Seminary from California. And uh, the letters, I noticed he started uh, drifting in his faith. You know, I'm not going to church. I'm not hanging around the, my godly friends, blah, blah, blah. And I'm back at the bar. And I knew the bar in question. It was a really rough bar. And um, I've been in there for lunch many times. And, um, and really, I had uh, just for lunch. And, um, <laughs> and, and Alan uh, started telling me, if I do not, it, he was in for attempted murder. Uh, in San Quentin. And he even drove me by the house one day that had the bullet holes in it from where he tried to kill a guy in another motorcycle gang. Um, and he told me, he said, um, if I do not get my walk back to Christ, with Christ, I know Christ is going to, he's going to remove me. He told me that. He was a new Christian. He got the concept. He said, all my gang buddies all understand my walk with Christ, how stellar it was. Now I'm back to dropping acid and doing all the stuff I used to do before. I've defamed him. He, he uh, wrote me a letter and told me I'm almost, uh, he said, in his letter, he said, I came all the way, uh, I came halfway to Dallas to come see you and Liz on my motorcycle, and I, I got afraid because I was ashamed, and I turned the motorcycle around like in New Mexico and went back to California. He died in California on that motorcycle in an intersection later, and I have his last letter where he told me, Marty, I came to see you, man, but I was too ashamed to come see you because I'm not walking with Christ like I should, and I think the Lord's going to remove me because I've defamed him. Can God remove a Christian? Can, can he? Uh, absolutely he can. Read the Bible. He did it in the Old Testament. He did it in the New Testament. Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Remember? They lied to God how much they tithe. And what'd they do? They held back the money. And God took them out. Uh, God did the same thing in the Old Testament. Does God normatively do this? No. No one's dropping yet. Everybody's still here. Yeah. But God can do this. I understand this. This is what Paul is saying. Be careful what you do. Because if you follow the deeds of the flesh, you shall die. God can remove you. But if you follow the deeds of the Spirit and mortify sin, God can grant you great life, great living. It's a warning to Christians. Six, uh, if you embrace those two views that I mentioned, you water down justification by faith by definition. I'm saved by faith, not by my mortification of sin. So the first section is counsel, but it's, it's a kind of spine-stiffening counsel where Paul says, pay attention. Uh, to your position in Christ. When he moves to the next point, verses 14 to 17, he says, uh, the fifth thing, he says, to gain victory is to realize your position in, in victorious Christian living. Because who are you? He says in verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If Christ is your Lord, he, he, he's leading you whether you're disobedient or obedient. Do you think if you sin and are carnal that he totally says, I'm not going to lead you anymore? No. Remember Peter? How many times did he deny Christ? Three. Do you know the man? Don't know him. Do you know? You sure look like one of his disciples, not me. And then he explodes in anger on the, the last guy. But then when Jesus comes back to him in the resurrection, what's the Lord do with Peter? Hey, Peter. Hey, Peter, come here. I have a question. You say you love me. Do you, do you love me? I mean, do you, do you really love me? You know? And he uses three different Greek words to analyze the love of Peter to say, Peter, I wonder about your love. And then Peter finally looks at Christ and what's he say to him? Lord, you know, you know that I love you. Agape love you. You know I do. See, the Lord uh, was, it was even leading a disobedient Peter who was carnal. And so God is in the business of leading his, his Christians. And, and Paul tells us here, he wants you to, you to remember who you are because the devil is really good at causing you to forget who you are. Look at verse 15. Paul says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we as Christians cry out, Abba, Father. What's this mean? He says, you've gone from one family, the family of sin, to the family of the Savior, and you can walk to the throne of God Almighty and not fear. You can pass by the, the, ser the seraphim. According to uh, Hebrews, or, uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 6, they're chanting constantly in the background, holy is God. Kadosh, 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 24-7. You can walk right by them on the glassy sea, approach the throne, see the, the rainbow around the throne, hear the lightning of God, see his Shekinah glory, and you can walk up to the throne of God, and you can call him what? Dad. 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 <laughs> My dad's up there now. I could call him dad. But isn't it awesome? You can walk up to the throne of God Almighty and, and not duck and run for cover. That even if you're carnal in your walk and it's compromised, you can still come to him and say, Lord, I have some issues and I need some help. But you can call him the Aramaic version of dad. 
dead. Why? Because you're adopted as a son. You really do need to understand Roman adoption. Because once somebody was, uh, 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 you can read all my notes tomorrow, I won't go into all of them. I put it all in my notes, but I don't have the time to explain it all to you. But once you were adopted as a, as a child in a Roman family, it was never undone. You were adopted forever. Four things happened when you were adopted into a Roman family. And they all have theological implications. Number one, the adopted person lost all the rights of his old family. And that kind of sounds like salvation, doesn't it? Two, it followed that uh, he became an heir of his father's estate. Whatever your new father owned was yours outright. Three, uh, in Roman law, the old life in, of the adopted person wiped out all of their former financial debts. That's cool. Had a house payment? I got adopted. Yeah. Wiped clean. I love Roman law. I'm trying to get it put into our government somehow. Um, uh, number four, in the eyes of the law, you are absolutely the son of your no father, no matter who else was born after you. These all have th theological implications. Number one, uh, you lost all rights to your old family of sin when you became a, a son of Christ. Amen. You're not that child anymore. Number two, uh, you are now an heir of all that God possesses. What does he own? I've heard it. I, I'm ordained Southern Baptist. I've, I've heard it a million times. Well, he owns a cattle on a, a thousand, hills. thousand hills. Who counted all that? I'm just went, but does he? Yes. Yeah, he does. Does he own more than that? Yes. Man, you could stand at any mountain range and go, I own it. <laughs> Look at any star system. It's mine. Why? Because my father created all these things. He owns them. See, you're wealthy. Number two, or number three, your old life is completely wiped clean. He's wiped the old you gone. Clean. You're holy. And then fourth, you're absolutely internally the son or daughter of your father. He never undoes that. When you understand your position in Christ, that changes everything. Why would I want to mortify sin? Because I'm a child of God. Therefore, if I'm a child of God, I should act like a child of God. Do you have children? Don't you want them to act like you or your father or the husband or mother? Don't you as parents? Or maybe not. <laughs> I'll pray for you. Paul says here, Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs of Christ, and if indeed we suffer with him, so that we might be glorified with him. This is interesting. The Spirit of God, he says, testifies to your spirit, whether you're obedient or disobedient, that you're his child. I mean, think about the last time you went off the spiritual re re reservation. Didn't you know in your heart of hearts that I should not be doing this? And God's telling you in your heart, your mind, you're not acting like my daughter. You need to come back. See, that's the internal witness of the Spirit. That's the identification of who you are. Paul says you also have an inheritance. He says you're an heir all over the place here. You're fellow heirs with Christ. Uh, what kind of inheritance? Well, and I don't have time to develop this or we'd be here till three, but what's he talking about? He's a rabbinical scholar. He's pointing to the Old Testament because he's a Jew. When they think of inheritance, they think of the word Yarash. Yarash is inheritance tied to the Abrahamic, Palestinian, Davidic, and New Covenant. I mean, that Israel will be the ones who bring the Messiah into the world. That the Davidic Covenant, they, that he, the Messiah will come to live and reign in Jerusalem in his kingdom through Israel. That Jeremiah 30, 31, that, that God will give a new covenant to Israel. He will redeem them as a nation. And through them, he will bless the nations. Paul's thinking about inheritance of the Messianic kingdom, not heaven. Because if he's thinking about heaven here, my entrance into it is based on my performance. He's not talking about that. That's why people get messed up in this passage. He's talking about believers becoming the heirs of Christ, first and foremost, of the Messianic kingdom and the Messiah. Remember your prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What are you praying for? The king to come. To what kingdom? to the messianic kingdom and as prophesied all throughout the Old Testament. And your placement in that kingdom is totally built upon your obedience and mortification of sin. I know that's true because Jesus talks about it quite a bit, especially in Luke chapter 19, where he says, when I return, I will divvy up authority in the kingdom based upon your obedience. He's not talking about heaven. Paul says, remember who you are. You are wealthy in, in, in Christ as a believer. You will be placed in his kingdom based upon how well you've run the race. Not heaven. That's a done deal. We're all going there. But Paul says, remember how you walk in the here and now. 
And he says, if you choose to walk in the here and now close to God, you will suffer with him. When you choose to walk a godly life, it will cost you. But it's worth it, because glorification comes when the Messiah appears. I leave you with a picture of a, of a flower that I saw in Israel. Um, it is a poppy. It's a poppy. And that's, the national, that's the state flower of California, which I find is totally ironic. Uh, <laughs> it, it is. Uh, but that particular little flower, where it was growing is what's unusual. One day I was teaching on the, on the, on the western wall apex there, uh, where all the rubble was. And I was teaching about this archaeological site, and I looked down at my feet, and I saw that. And I thought to myself, this is, this is like a thing from God. Because among, amongst all the rubble of the destroyed stones, I looked down there and thought, not only is it red for the red blood of Christ that forgave me of my sin, but it shows me that even in this place of utter destruction, there's great hope of life. That's Jesus, see? Think about it, your life. I'll just push it a little further. Your life... You've seen those stones drop down to the street and your Christian walk is somewhat compromised and you're thinking it's all over. What's God telling you today? You need to come home because I'm here to give you hope. My blood, my blood covers you, I got you. Uh, and there's hope even in this rubble for God to do great things in and through you. I've been praying for all of you all week and God's going to do some great things. May you be obedient. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the pen of Paul. Uh, some of his words are milk, easy things to understand. Some things are like a big steak. Hard to chew, but most enjoyable when we realize what you are saying. Thank you for the depth, for the shallow nature of the word, for the, the parts that go way down deep. Thank you for all of these things. They feed our souls and teach us how to walk godly before you. We praise you for the victories you will give people in our church. And thank you for the, the little flower that shows your, your grace and your compassion toward us. In Christ's name, amen.